You know, the press in the larger sense, you know, both both the, the, the broadcast radio and the newspapers were really rolling the dice because they were playing up. I mean, they were building up, you know, uh, these leaders and our soldiers and everything. What happened if D-Day failed? What would happen if they had to back off the beaches and say, we got to do this somewhere else at a different time? The credibility of the press, I mean, they really rolled the dice on this because their credibility would have been torpedoed. Nobody would have believed them again. Now that, to them, that I think the, to the American people would have been akin to George Creel CPI type propaganda. Welcome to Heroes Behind Headlines. I'm your host, Ralph Pizzullo. Our guest today is author Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Ruziecki to talk about his important book, Invasion On, D-Day, The Press, and the Making of an American Narrative, which describes the process of how and why the United States press developed a standing narrative of the World War II operation known as D-Day. In it, author Ruziecki explores in detail the mechanics of precisely how radio broadcast and newspapers in the 24-hour period surrounding the 6th of June, 1944, gathered and then communicated facts, images, impressions, attitudes, and meaning that formed for all Americans nearly simultaneously a common narrative organized around four themes. The significance and grand scale of the operation, the sacralization of the event, the gifted and talented nature of allied senior leaders, and the purity and valor of the average American soldier. These are themes that have remained fixed in the American consciousness ever since. Author Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Rosiecki is with us today to help us understand how the media shaped our perception of this important historical event and others. It's my great honor to welcome him as today's Hero Behind the Headlines. Heroes Behind Headlines with Ralph Pizzullo. Tell us a little bit about your background and then how you became interested in this topic. Well, I was an Army infantry officer for 25 years, and then I retired. I wanted to do something in academia, so uh, and I got an offer to uh, to be the dean of academics of the Army Inspector General School. But throughout my whole time, both in the Army in uniform and out of uniform, I've been you know fascinated with World War II. Mm-hmm. I saw it as the event that defined the world that I ended up growing up in, that my grandparents and parents grew up in, and uh, and so I had a lot of interest in it for that reason, and it. You know, World War II is also what inspired me to join the Army, especially D-Day, mainly because I, I, I just saw the basically the, you know, frontal attack on the beaches as a, as, a, as, a, as a grand gesture of unselfishness that how could you match that? And I think Winston Churchill said it best. Uh, and I hope I don't misquote him. Um, but uh, he said that uh, when, um, you know, it's the most unselfish act that one group of people has ever done for another group of people. Wow. And I and I believe that. Yeah. And, and I've always wanted to do something about D-Day. Um, uh, my first two books, first one had to do with the Battle of the Bulge, the second one, the Battle for Germany in April 1945. Um, but there really weren't any windows open, if you would, you know, in the historiography of D-Day that gave me a. Uh, a way in. I just didn't want to repeat something. I didn't want to just kind of churn out something that, you know, had been done. Um, but then I started looking through a lot of the, I'm, I'm kind of a collector of World War II documents and so on. I'll be that guy at the flea market or the antique shop <laughs> buying them up if they're there mm-hmm. or I'll find them or look for them on eBay. Well, I, I, I amassed after doing a lot of interviews with a lot of World War II veterans, um, they would always offer me, you know, here, you could just take this stuff. It's, you know, my kids may not, you know, appreciate it as much. And and whether they participated in it or not, they all almost to the person had saved uh, the June 6, 1944 D-Day newspaper, whether it was their, their spouses that stayed at home, the kids or whatever. And I would end up with these and they were fascinating. And I just kept them. I put them in the, the appropriate archival plastics and everything so nothing would happen to them. <laughs> 
over time, I amassed about 65 of them. And I, and I started looking at them and I said, you know, there's some common threads here. Yeah. And in my time in the Army, I had experience with the media and I've been in certain operations where I knew exactly what had happened and why. And, and I knew that some things sometimes get misinterpreted or misreported by the media. Mm -hmm. But what I noticed in the years following that when I would, you know, I'd run into a buddy or something, you'd pop up and start talking about it. Hey, you were in that operation, weren't you? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, well tell me about this, that, and the other. I said, well, that that was kind of corrected over time in the press. But no, what? And I and 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 that wasn't a one-off. I would get I would get a lot of discuss. I would have a lot of discussions with people like that, and it and it and it gave me the impression that gee, the media really has a lot of power. And those first reports, those initial drafts of history, as they call it, absolutely really stick. Yeah. And I said, let me do let me do a litmus test. And I didn't want to get into myth making because I think the development of a narrative once it you know once it is no longer part of lived memory, that becomes the myth. Yeah. Um, so I didn't like to use the word myth, um, but I, I did believe that there was something out there that was that was sticking that had the potential to become a myth. Yeah. And I think it's probably on its way there now, since you know most World War II veterans are passing. That's right. Yeah. But uh, and once it does, and I think if it continues to stick, then we're looking at a legitimate myth. And I think in the case of the book I've written here, I think that 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 narrative that I've talked about has probably at this point in time become myth because it's 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 physically embodied in the D-Day Memorial in Bedford, Virginia. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can go there, and the four themes I identify in on Invasion on. Uh, you know, the, the you know, the, the the fact that it was the biggest operation of the war, that it was a sacred enterprise, had moralistic overtones that was led by the best, uh, you know, the best leaders we could find mm -hmm. and best trained soldiers and everything. All of those things are represented tangibly, physically huh. at the uh, the Bedford D-Day Memorial. And um, so I, I think in with that in mind, it's we it's probably arrived. <laughs> yeah at that myth level. But, you know, up until the point that I was writing it, I, I still saw it as as just a narrative that, you know, was was commonly assembled. And I, and I leaned heavily on this fellow. I don't know if you're familiar with him, Benedict Anderson, mm -hmm. 1985 book he wrote called Imagine Communities, where he talked about the, con the connecting of people in disparate geographical locations based upon the com you know the common ceremony of newspaper readership mm -hmm. or radio listenership yeah. or nowadays you know TV viewing yeah. and so we're all seeing things in you know you know simultaneously but back in World War II I mean the closest thing they could get to some common theme was actually picking up the newspaper that was being uh you know filled filled with news by uh, you know, a very finite set of uh, wire services yeah. uh, that were both overseas and in the States, um, you know, generating basically the framing that would become, you know, this 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 common D-Day narrative all linked together by that common ceremony of of readership and listenership in the case of this particular situation. Yeah, I've encountered the same thing in some of the books that I've written that have gone back and, you know, re-examined. Uh, Pretty, you know, you know, somewhat recent events. Yeah, I agree with you completely. A certain narrative gets formed right away, and I've gone back sometimes and asked the reporters, New York Times reporters, Washington Post reporters, like, "You got it wrong. This isn't what happened. Do you realize that?" Right. And they'll go, "Yeah, but at the time, you know, it seemed right," and then it just kind of gets implanted in people's consciousness right and those initial impressions actually you know find some purchase in films and popular television shows and stuff absolutely i remember one of the things that uh you know it, that made me think of world war ii as a good war i'm completely disabused of that notion mind you right now but i remember the show combat with vic morrow yeah sure boy as a little kid in the 70s i mean we used Brother and I used to stay up at night, and, and, and at eleven o'clock we had a TV in our room, and my parents were death on it. They didn't want us to stay up that late, you know, because we had school the next day. But my brother and I would always get up. We would always set the alarm clock so we could watch that thirty-minute episode rerun yeah. of Combat. And 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 I mean, those, you know, the the, the common the the good war theme was just rampant. Yeah. In that, and the idea that, but but you know, but it brought it down to a human grandeur level, and that had appeal. 
and the fact that they were doing something that was noble. Of course. You know, I mean, there were there were definable bad guys, yeah. you know, that we, haven't, you know, that I mean, yeah, I guess we can say that that's probably true with Al Qaeda and play, you know, folks like that ISIS nowadays. But yeah. back then, these were folks in, you know, uniformed up and they were they were nation states that were you know, duking it out. And I mean, it was, you know, it was a big, you know, grandiose stratego game that was as deadly as you could imagine. What I found very interesting about your book is how the strategy that was used by FDR and people in his administration was very different from that of World War I. Oh, yeah. In terms of dealing with the press. You're talking about the George Creel Committee on Public Information that Woodrow Wilson had, uh, had set up. Um, I mean, I think, you know, as everybody's aware, we got into that war pretty late. Yeah. And the idea was stay neutral, stay out of Europe's wars. And then, you know, we obviously had the 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 issues in the Atlantic there, sinking of the uh, Lusitania and all those kinds of things that prompted us to get into that war. And um there there wasn't an appetite for it. And I'm 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 not I'm I'm not quite sure I I, I can remember off the top of my head every little detail, but Creel and company were were enlisted to whip up support for from through propaganda, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, uh, a, a, an effort to you know get the country to support what Wilson was trying to do. The thing about it was, is they told outright lies. You know, I mean, it was propaganda in its worst sense, mm -hmm. you know, half truths, untruths or just complete omissions. And they came up with this crusading rhetoric, which was surprising that Eisenhower chose to, uh, you know, chose to adopt. Yeah. Um, and they made it into, they made Pershing and company into, uh, you know, these grand crusaders and even published things, posters of, uh, you know, Pershing on a horse leading these grand crusaders behind him in, in, in the old crusades type, you know, uh, outfits and everything with, you know, armor and, Gosh. you know, and, and the whole nine yards. And it was, it was, it was very strange stuff. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but people were, people felt burned. Yeah. You know, after World War II, because they didn't, we didn't adopt the Treaty of Versailles. After World War One. After World War One, I, I mean, the Senate did not ratify it, and so they said, "Well, what did we fight this whole thing for?" The League of Nations that Woodrow Wilson was pushing as a post-war enterprise just never, never got off the ground. So people felt burned, and that carried over into World War II. Uh huh. And um, and people were, and that's why I think that Roosevelt, Roosevelt hated the CPI yeah. and George Creel and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, because the CPI had been a pretty heavy handed, oh. basically censorship organization. Oh, it's preposterous. I have a, I, I actually have a whole stack of pamphlets that they put out, original copies of them. And to read the stuff is just, it's just so sensationalized. And they, they would just tell lies too. Yeah. I mean, they would, you know, they want, they whipped up a fervor to get everybody to hate the German Hun. Yeah. And they actually manufactured events that the Germans never did, like massacring people in some of these towns on the, you know, near the trench, the trench line areas up there in yeah. Belgium or wherever. As Colonel Ruziecki points out, American distrust and propaganda style messaging had its roots in the Committee on Public Information, or CPI, established by President Woodrow Wilson during World War I which he characterizes as an overt attempt to whip up ideological fervor for the war and cast the Axis enemies as bloodthirsty monsters. Formed in April 1917 and headed by Chairman George Creel, the objective of the CPI was in Creel's own words to direct, quote, the printed word, the spoken word, the motion picture, the telegraph, the cable, the wireless, the poster, the signboard, all these to be used in our campaign to make our own people and other peoples understand the causes that compelled us to take arms. The CPI, under President Wilson's direction, also established the very first program of voluntary censorship of the press. Anyway, people got really really sensitized to propaganda. And I think that the FDR knew that when he established the Office of War Information, he had told Elmer Davis, who was the head of it, make certain that you don't, you know, we're not going to get into that kind of business again. Mm -hmm. And we operated off essentially in, in FDR's estimation, a strategy of truth. Yeah. Now, 
you know, that didn't mean strategy of truth meant that you're going to you're going to reveal all these classified sources and all this you know, secret military information. Uh, but but it still was, you know, a far afield. And, and, and I'll tell you, FDR had to be kicked, drag, you know, had to be dragged kicking and screaming into developing something that was even akin to the CPI. And that was obviously the OWI, the Office of War Information. But they were mostly just traffic cops. They directed, you know, information that came from the armed forces, the different agencies and the government and everything. And they let they became the PR people for their own stuff. Elmer Davis's folks just kind of directed it towards where it needed to be, you know, and, and if it was required, you know, for overseas transmission and consumption, then so be it. Um, but but that was it. And so, you know, and, and, and the newspapers were sensitive to that as well. The editors, mm-hmm. um, because they knew that uh, they could quickly lose their audience. Uh, they would lose a lot of credibility if they allowed those, uh, you know, uh, that kind of behavior to to kind of emerge and i will tell you that there are quite a few scholars um one of whom was uh on my committee dr sam Leibovic, um who have you know who have come down you know on, on the side of saying that you know we and you in world war ii with with all the evidence of civil we did not cross that line into propaganda we came close we took we stepped on it yeah. a little bit but for the most part we played it straight yeah. and um and the evidence shows that well, what's interesting in your book is you show how the main media in those days was conveyed, the message was conveyed through radio and newspapers, and how in both cases they really police themselves. Yeah. They saw themselves as having an important, playing an important role in disseminating information about the war. They decided sort of like the themes that you talked about before in terms of how they were going to report D-Day. Uh, you know, they're all on the team. They were all on Team America. So there's no there's no doubt about that. But it also meant that they uh, were still professional news people mm-hmm. and they knew a big story when they saw it. And what was also unique about D-Day was they had a big six month run up to it mm-hmm. so they could prepare and they conversed with each other essentially very loosely uh, through their um, uh, their trade journals, mm-hmm. you know, the broadcast and broadcast advertising and editor and publisher for the newspapers and wire services. And um, they all sort of did pre-D-Day preparations in kind of the same vein, both sides knowing that there was waning support for the war effort. Hmm. Um, there were mine, yeah, there, there were there were coal mine strikes and things like that, things you wouldn't think would be happening during World War II, but there were still disgruntled people out there and that kind of stuff was going on. Um, the press saw themselves in a unique role that, you know, when D-Day came, they were going to play it up and they were going to be optimistic about it. And that was something that just kind of happened organically. Uh, I couldn't I, I kept I desperately tried to find uh, a root cause behind it. You know, a smoking gun that maybe there was some, uh, you know, the, the there was some document the federal government put out to the press that said, hey, do it this way. Now, there's no evidence of that whatsoever. They did it. They did it organically and on their own. Interesting. And it meant that they did a lot of preparation. They did a lot of pre-work. So they they wrote up a lot of these uh, these 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 uh, pre-approved articles, if you will, about the nature of the training the troops received and about the biographical sketches of the uh, the most senior leaders. It was it, it was it was and then, and then when they got the official source information, what little they got on D Day, they put it all together and it just fit. Yeah. Uh, the big irony for me in all of this, though, was that. Their um, their representatives overseas, their war correspondents who were aligned with these respective uh, newspapers and radio stations and everything had a completely different agenda. Mm. And what I mean by that is that they were doing everything in their power to be able to get the story off the beaches. In other words, they wanted to land on the beaches because they knew that's where the center of gravity would be. Right the paratroopers of the air force or anything but on those beaches and they wanted to be able to show that um you know it's either succeeding or failing yeah and they wanted to show the granular level of it now for those folks like don whitehead and everybody who landed on omaha beach if 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 the story he was tapping out on the on the beach and he was if it had ever made it to the newspapers on d-day it would it would have created a conundrum because i mean the Associated Press that had been forced to confront the fact that, gee, things aren't going so well in Omaha. And that kind of flies in the face of this larger narrative that we're 
building here. How's it going to pull the rug out from under it? Yeah. And it, they never had to face that conundrum. They never had to, to face it because, you know, ironically, not except for, I think, I think in the British sector, one homing pigeon made it back to England <laughs> with some news from like one of the sword beach or something. I don't know. Yeah. Um, they, uh, nothing got out. They had, they created like a 600 person battalion PR battalion that was in support of these war correspondents. And they brought, you know, had these, these things called commando recorders and yeah. wireless links and all that stuff. And none of it worked. And, and, and which is one of the great ironies of the story. And one of the things I found most interesting is I discovered some of this in my research. Did it not work or was it just sort of like eaten up in the bureaucracy so that it never got through? It's the friction of war. Yeah. They got caught up and this is what happens when you cross the line of departure and the plan turns into whatever is happening in front of you. Right. And that's what happened. I mean, the jeeps that they were unloading from the landing craft onto the beaches either got swamped or they 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 ended up taking a Panzerfaust round and exploding. Mm -hmm. The equipment didn't work. And their backup plan was that they had these speedboats designated to pick up the war correspondents. And that this was part of the plan. It wasn't never happened. Mm -hmm. And to take them to the USS Augusta, I think, which was Omar Bradley's flagship, and use their transmission mechanisms there to their radio links to get the story off. Yeah. None of it. Yeah. Complete crapola. Yeah. And there's a guy, I think Edward Kennedy, who's kind of an irascible character. Um, as I, I can't remember if he was part of the AP or who he worked for. Anyway, he he just he I quote him in the book invasion on uh with uh you know saying that you know despite all the crap we put into it all the planning and everything for six months over in england yeah to get the story out not a damn thing worked at the very end uh, which is but the way he puts it he has a unique turn of phrase yeah and um that's why it was worth quoting but what it accomplished is that there was just sort of a very uniform a uh, story that came out of d-day yeah, very anodyne, very uh, very vanilla flavored when it came to anything that might have been considered contentious. In planning the D-Day attack, Allied military leaders understood that casualties might be staggeringly high, but it was a cost they were willing to pay in order to establish an infantry stronghold in France. Days before the invasion, General Dwight D. Eisenhower was told by a top strategist that paratrooper casualties alone could be as high as 75%. Because of bad weather and fierce German resistance, the D-Day beach landings were chaotic and bloody, with the first waves of landing forces suffering terrible losses, particularly the U.S. troops at Omaha Beach and the Canadian divisions at Juneau Beach. While casualty figures are difficult to verify and not all wounded soldiers were counted, the accepted estimate is that the Allies suffered 10,000 total casualties, which includes both killed and wounded on D-Day itself. The highest casualties occurred on Omaha Beach, where 2,000 U.S. soldiers were killed, wounded, or went missing. And at Sword Beach and Gold Beach, where 2,000 British troops were killed, wounded, or went missing. And at Juneau Beach, where 340 Canadian soldiers were killed and another 574 wounded. So people felt that, oh my God, this is this almost sacred event that took place. Yeah. And uh, our troops performed admirably and the germans sort of uh, collapsed you know they didn't perform as well they weren't as brave as our troops and this became the story that everybody heard and was you know backed up by statements from eisenhower and montgomery and other leaders yeah. so it was sort of the, very much this sort of what we call now like this whole pr effort that came out yeah. and one thing that you talked about in the book which i didn't realize was that the headlines in the newspapers reporting the D-Day event were unprecedented. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Seven-inch uh, headlines. Seven or eight-inch, yeah, one San Francisco newspaper. I mean, from the top of the page to the fold, Wow, that was the entire headline, Invasion On, or something similar to that. 
And I, I don't think that's ever been repeated. I don't know that. I, I can't say that with conviction, but I, I, I do know that up to that point, it was unprecedented. But also the other, impre- they also um, used red ink. Yeah. And, uh, and and that was an unusual thing. And that was one of the, that was a good thing about owning original copies of the newspapers because I could see the red. Yeah. The micro stuff that's in the Library of Congress and in other archives and stuff there, all those things were photographed for microfish and they were done so black and white. So those, those details are lost. Mm -hmm. Um, But the fact that, you know, that they went with the red ink in a time when newsprint was scarce Mm -hmm. and production values had to be kind of ramped down. I mean, they spent some money to do that. It also slowed down the presses to actually get that extra red ink in there, but they saw it as so important that they were willing to, that, you know, the newspapers were willing to to take the risk. Yeah. And as you point out in your book, there had been other invasions, other large scale attacks. Yeah, port, right. You know, at North Africa, Sicily. North Africa Sicily. and Sicily. And, and, and they were sort of not treated this way at all. Well, and, and I think part of that too, that's true. Um, but part of that uh, was also that um, the press was not given the same type of freedom at the time. And a lot of that was kept from the American public. There wasn't a six month run up to those things. Yeah. There, I mean, there was for planning purposes. Right. But for notification, I mean, the first time the United States or most of the people in the United States learned of Operation Torches, like the day it happened. Yeah. No, well, they were trying to keep it very secret. Yeah. They were keeping it hush hush and everything. Yeah. So, uh, but but the language of what they would call those things, these landings or mm-hmm. whatever it may be, evolved over time to say, you know, uh, now we're invading Sicily and everything. And actually, there was some contention uh, prior to the run up to D-Day uh, by many folks. It was there was some back and forth in some newspapers and things like that, even a letter that went to Elmer White of the OWI. We ought not to use the word invasion because it has a bad connotation. It means that you're. You're you're showing up on somebody's doorstep uninvited, yeah, and um and and that has a negative context, and uh, so we'd rather we'd rather use uh, something like uh, liberation, yeah. And Elmer Davis, as I recall from the OWI, said, "Yes, absolutely, I'm going to mandate that throughout all my <laughs> OWI folks. That's what they're going to use when they refer to it, and not as they're going to use liberation instead of invasion. Nobody listened, yeah, to the person, yeah." <laughs> what I could find. Nobody, they just ignored it. They said, you know what? That means invasion means, okay, it may have a bad smell in one sense, but it means that we've got the initiative. We're showing up on their doorstep. Right. They're not showing up on ours and we're taking it to them now. Yeah. And I think that's why, you know, and that, that, that fact alone really led me to title the book invasion on to really yes. capture yeah. that particular note, you know, that, that, that use of the word, because, uh, um, it, it was it was it was not a word that was used lightly in the press. I mean, they they thought about it. Yeah. And um, it, it was just an interesting little side note. That's all. Yeah. And being an English major. Yeah, sure. Of course I've got a combination of English degrees and history degrees. Language is important. You know, semiotics is uh, kind of a fascinating hobby. Absolutely. So absolutely. Connotate word, you know, connotations and stuff. I, I find that, you know, I find those things interesting. Uh, they are interesting. Not so much others. Yeah. But. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what you also point out in the book, which is really interesting, is that sort of the one dissonant note in all this was the black press. Yeah. Well, everybody, you know, because D-Day happened on a Tuesday, everybody in the nation got their news from the predominantly white press on Tuesday because most black newspapers did not publish until Fridays or Saturdays. So they got so they had to rely on that news and they didn't see any indication that there were black troops who were in some most of them in support units and stuff. There was a barrage balloon battalion that landed on Omaha and Utah. They didn't get any play. I mean, there was a little bit I've I found, but they didn't get any play in what would otherwise. Be this seemed to be directed too, because the Secretary of War Stimson had a very sort of negative. Well, that's true. In terms of allowing them to actually pick up weapons and fight as infantry, yeah. he had some pretty negative belief systems going there. So what I got from your book was that they were deliberately uh, black troops were deliberately kept out of combat roles. That's true. On D Day. That's true. Okay. Except for that one battalion, the 320th Raj Balloon Battalion. That hung balloons yeah. on the beach. That's absolutely true. 
And um, it's reflected in the black press predominantly. I mean, for you know, they just generally just ignored the invasion when they're they're uh, you know when a few days later their 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 newspapers came out. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing is, they were still behind the war effort. They just were silent on D Day, so you didn't see any of that. Yeah. Um, except for a couple of exceptions, I think the Pittsburgh Courier, which is uh, which I think had the highest circulation of any black newspaper in, in World War II. It had a lot of influence. They created the double. They came up with the double V campaign. You know, victory over discrimination, victory over Hitler. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, and they had a they had a correspondent who was actually overseas, who turned out to kind of have the same chops as uh, as many of the uh, the white you know wire service correspondents and everything like that. Um, his name was, I think, William Dixon. Yeah, William Dixon. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and and he actually reported like them, but he he didn't have much to sink his teeth into. He did his best to represent African Americans and other people of color in those newspapers. But to me, it's it's a it's a it's a gaping. It was a gaping hole, and I and I had I have to admit this. I treated it only superficially when I did my first draft. Mm-hmm. I went back and looked at it. I said, you know, there's a bigger story here. I need to de- I need to dig deeper into the African American newspapers of the time and the attitude. Some of them, some of them were actually some of those at black newspapers were actually a little bit more sympathetic to the cause in terms of supporting the war because they were actually seeing some progress. Mm-hmm. I mean, there were um, in the Navy, uh, fo- you know, there was some upward mobility. Um, there were job openings now with the defense plants and things like that. Um, so a lot of what they, you know, the African American community was arguing for, they were getting. Yeah. So they were making some of just not. It what it didn't. It didn't start until March of 1945 that Eisenhower said, "Put a rifle in the hand of an African American and let him fight his infantry." Yeah. There was a practical reason for that because of losses. Yeah. They did, needed replacements, but also the realization that these men could fight. Yeah. Well, sure. I mean, a lot of them, especially during the Battle of the Bulge, you are done offensive. Had to pick up weapons, cooks, you know, folks like that. Otherwise, when it, and and they, well, how should I say it? Kicked ass. Yeah, I don't know any way to say it. Yeah, yeah. But they did exceptionally well, and then after that, you know, within a within a couple of months, you've got seven, eight medals of honor. Yeah, you know that were later awarded decades later, unfortunately, yeah. but distinguished service crosses, which you know that's saying something. Right, right. And as you point out sort of the contradiction wasn't lost on the black press that we're talking about liberating Europe. Yeah. But we're not taking care of our own people at home. We're not, we're still not liberating True. black people and giving them the same rights. And so right. in their reporting, they're always bringing that up, which makes sense. The black leaders at the time, the national leadership for the black community re- recognized or at least believed that if uh, their folks weren't allowed to actually pick up arms and fight that they would not have the justification that they wanted to have or needed to have to uh to be able to say we deserve more yeah. after the war you know you need you need to you know and, and well frankly i mean it's uh, for those people who study the civil rights movement i mean world war ii was the you know the genesis of the civil rights movement yes that's when you started to see a lot of that kind of stuff take shape mm-hmm. you know malcolm x and everything was uh you know was you know was in uniform and everything it was it was you know living that discrimination and it really cemented in his mind i think and i don't know much i'm not an expert on malcolm x or anything like that but i think that you know i mean just the, the kind of the treatment that a lot of them got during world war ii he wanted to see you know changes to the to to you know the fifth order of magnitude whereas the changes were incremental With a need to shore up the U.S. armed forces as war intensified in Europe, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt decided in September 1940 that black men could register for the draft, but they would remain segregated, and the military would determine the proportion of black men inducted into the service. In 1941, there were fewer than 4,000 African Americans serving in the U.S. military and only 12 African-American officers. By 1945, that number had risen to 1.2 million African-Americans serving in uniform in Europe and the Pacific, including thousands of African-American women in the women's auxiliaries. Predominantly black units included the Red Ball Express, which delivered critical supplies of gasoline, ammunition, food, 
mechanical parts and medical supplies to General Patton's Third Army in France, driving up to 400 miles on narrow roads in the dead of the night without headlights to avoid detection by the Germans. Another was the 761st Tank Division, which became the first black division to see ground combat in Europe and helped liberate 30 towns under Nazi control and fought bravely in the Battle of the Bulge. Still another were the Tuskegee Airmen, the all-black fighter pilot group trained at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, which flew 1,600 combat missions and destroyed 237 German aircraft on the ground and 37 in the air. Another thing that you point out that is really interesting is that D-Day was an allied effort right there were canadian troops there were french troops there were british troops and our press pretty much characterized it as an american yep invasion which was also <laughs> yeah. not accurate and now well, the, Can the, the canadians kind of did too oh yeah <laughs> it is we we did it yeah well and 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 the british a little bit looking at their newspapers i think i mentioned that just in passing um, but, uh, but yeah, um, we, it was, it was, it was kind of a U.S. only thing, but there, I think in, there were some exceptions and I, and I did make some effort to point some of those out where, you know, you talked about it. I would say that where that particular argument falls flat is in the description of the senior leadership yeah. that made it into our newspapers, because there was a lot of, you know, there was a you know, Montgomery, he was a, he was a winner. He won, he won battles in people's eyes. And you've got Air Marshal Tedder and you've got, you know, Trafford Lee Mallory, who was an Air Marshal, people like that, who were uh, part of the senior leadership of the invasion. And they got they got as much mention uh, in some cases, if not more than folks like, you know, uh, Omar Bradley and Jimmy Doolittle and people like that who were other mm -hmm. senior. And I, well, Eisenhower, he blew them all out of the water. He got yeah. they put a magnifying glass on him. <laughs> I would say that was probably the one area where um, there was some allied inclusion there. Mm -hmm. um, there was no xenoph no xenophobia on that one, but when it came to the rest of it, yeah, it was. I agree with you. It was that was another interesting aspect of your book is that the lionization of these leaders, and they picked out half a dozen or more. And I imagine it's pretty difficult to go back and figure out who these men really were, because. The way they were described in the press, they were sort of these, you know, spiritual figures, you know, great warriors, the perfect man for the job, humble. They had battlefield failures that never made it into the press. <laughs> right. those, so those were kind of conveniently left out, you know, like, but, you know, they, they had their own moments, Dunkirk and things like that. Some of them. Yeah. Um, that uh that that never that never made it into the that never made it into that narrative so the american people were treated somewhat like children yeah when you look at it yeah yeah in a in a way but you know the press in a larger sense you know both both the the, the broadcast radio and the newspapers were really rolling the dice because they were playing up i mean they were building up you know uh these leaders and our soldiers and everything what happened if d-day failed yeah what would happen if they had to back off the beaches and say, we got to do this somewhere else at a different time? Yeah. The credibility of the press. I mean, they really rolled the dice on this. Yeah. Because their credibility would have been torpedoed. Nobody would have believed them again. Now that to them, that I think the, to the American people would have been akin to George Creel CPI type propaganda. And it came close. Yeah. I mean, you don't get into the specifics of the, of the invasion, but you do point out that Omaha went really badly. And there was a point where they thought of Montgomery, I think it was, who was almost gave the order to pull back. That's actually Omar Bradley. In that oh, case. I'm sorry. Omar Bradley. Yeah. Omar Bradley for the first army. Yeah. In the U.S. side. Yeah. He he thought because he he actually, in fact, what's the guy's name? I have a I actually met him and there's some documentation from him. He was part of a he was an aide to Omar Bradley and Omar Bradley put him in a speedboat. And said, get, you know, because he was on the USS Augusta and this is big flagship and everything. He goes, I don't know what's going on. Nobody's communicating. All I see is smoke and stuff exploding on that beach and things are all over the place. He goes, get in a boat and go find out what's going on. Yeah. And um, and this guy did. I wish I could remember his name off the top of my head. Um, 
But uh, but and this is not in the book. But I mean, he went out there and he <laughs> he uh, uh, he zipped back and forth. You know, basically did race tracks around there, trying to get a closer look at what's going on. He came back to the USS Augusta, ran up to Bradley, and said, "Not good." Yeah, yeah, real bad. And uh, that's when that's when Bradley started thinking, like, "Oh man, we're gonna we may pull off the casualty." He said, "Their bodies everywhere." He said, "You know, you can't distinguish one wave after another. Everything's jammed up on itself. The tanks didn't work. Wow, the duplex drive tanks. You know, yeah, most of them, except for one or two, uh, sunk into the surf." Um, you know, and there were bodies and, and, and battlefield detritus everywhere. And it was, uh, and then it was, it was, you know, and none of that was reported. I mean, it eventually got reported some, mostly in, you know, magazines and things like that. And, you know, those first editions in July came out, I think Hemingway did a piece. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You quote that in your book. And, and, and he, and, and, and he, and in his particular article, he, uh, um colliers he he wrote for yeah um he he said it was just really awful you really don't know it even you know put a guy like him you know nobel prize recipient for literature made him speechless he said i, I don't i can't write about you know what i saw and he didn't even land on the beach he saw it from a particular distance yeah and um and so yeah it was bad it, yeah. was, it was as bad as bad gets another thing that i found very interesting and i think we see examples of it today is that Everything was looked at from a very far distance and often uh, in terms of the press's uh, point of view. Oh, I see. Yeah. And often not even uh, the actual events that were taking place. So they were using a lot of stock footage. Yeah. They, they were using uh, a lot of articles and pictures of the fleet. Yeah. But not in action. Yeah. The closest they came to an action was when the fleet launched. And somebody in another boat from a distance took a picture. I think the guy's name was Bert Brandt from Acme News Pictures or something. <laughs> and, and 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 embarkation photos. Those were the only ones that actually were D-Day photos that made it through the wire back to the United States. Everything, yeah, everything that they were forced to use in the state side was stock photos of the GI's training. Yeah. This is what it would look like if you know if you were there watching the beach. This is how we would do it. The thing is, it was, you know, it was all very sanitized. Yeah. You know. There was, yeah. there, there was, you know, there, there was no, uh, there were, there were no complicating images there, no, you know, dead bodies or anything. Eventually, they did start to show that there, there, you know, the government started to lighten up on that and start allowed, you know, photos uh, of, of, of bodies to be, you know, published and everything. But they, it, it kind of was from a distance, and it was of somebody just laying there, and mm -hmm. it, it was never like what it le eventually in 1945 started happening in the Pacific, where they, you know, life photographers were taking pictures of dead Japanese soldiers with half their faces blown off. Very different treatment, and they were publishing that stuff, yeah, which is a whole different animal. And I don't know if that's, that there's a whole different discussion there about you know racism and uh, how we you know viewed the Japanese at that particular time and. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so, but, you know, the great guy named John Dower who wrote about that. Yeah. But from the American public's point of view, you know, you've got your sons and daughters over there. You want to know what's going on. I mean, you're the ones who are paying for this war. You're the ones who are paying for it in blood, sweat and tears. And you're, you're sort of babied along. You're sort of like fed pieces of information. And then there was this big effort to tell everybody to like be solemn and pray. Yeah. And this was a, that's the best you can do. Like, we're not going to really tell you what's going on, but go pray. Yeah. You can be there in spirit with the soldiers, even though you can't be there physically with them. And that was, that was basically an, yeah. a, you know, a, a way that you could participate if, mm -hmm. you know, you know, barring actually, you know, picking up an M1 Garand and, you know, yeah. Coming out of a landing craft on Omaha or something, you know that, and they felt, and, and it made it comforted people. Yeah, I'm sure. Just for, it's it's my impression that it comforted people. Mm -hmm. So I think it was uh, I think it was a good thing, but it was uh, but it was it was pre planned too. Mm -hmm. I mean, the idea that you know folks were they were going to tell folks to go pray, so it wasn't as spontaneous as some would some would otherwise think. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, D Day prayers were prepared by some of the national religious leaders, and newspapers had them. Yeah. And, uh, when the time came, you know, they, they quickly published them and everything. And people were you people were reciting them 
inside churches, which stayed open all day. Synagogues stayed open. Um, you know, even new movie theaters. Yeah. They would have places or people to come in to, to pray because it was just a, a common space where they could all come together and, um, you know, and, 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 and share in the angst. Yeah. Of this invasion, because everybody up to that point had been led to believe that this is the first time we were actually going to confront the German army in its entirety. Yeah. And on. It's not going to be one of these peripheral things that was happening in the Mediterranean or not. And there was still a lot. There was a lot of angst about that. Yeah. And um, and, and, and and I will tell you that, you know, the FDR and his administration were very conscious of the fact that the longer the war went on, the, the less likely it was that the country was going to be in full support of it. I mean, people were getting war weary. We know it today. Yeah. I mean, we experienced it today after 20, yeah. 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah, for sure. I mean, a level that, but, but even for a few years, I mean, people, it wasn't clear Yeah. You know, to many people how long it was going to take to finish the war. Yeah. And that's not something we hear about or talk about much in history. No. I mean, that, that surprised me when you pointed that out in the book the war weariness you know before d-day yeah that's made this event even more important and had to be played and probably added to the fact that it was played up so much that's right this is our moment and we're going to nail this we're going to take it to the germans type of thing and the press was a principal enabler in that enterprise and meanwhile you could argue that the real fighting was going on in russia oh yeah <laughs> where they <laughs> where the losses were astronomical and where most of Hitler's army was, was engaged. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, the, the Russians, uh, the Soviets back then, they didn't, they didn't have the greatest tactics either. I mean, the, you know, their, their menu of assault options was frontal assault, which by the time as the war progressed, we, we got away from that. Yeah. Except you couldn't get away from it with D-Day. I mean, you're landing on a beach, you're right into it. But yeah. Um, so a lot of the Russians, I mean, I've done a lot of reading on the Russians. I've been to I've been to Russia and looked on the Eastern Front, some of those battlefields. And, uh, you know, a lot they of those. Were brutal, people, right? Br well, absolutely. they were just cannon fodder. I mean, because they, they're and just like now what we see in Ukraine is that, you know, they 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 overcome by sheer numbers. Yeah, they can show up, bring everybody, slap a rifle in his hand. Doesn't matter how well trained he is or not. We got more than the other guy. We're just going to run over him. Right. That's how they got Crimea. Yeah. And um, and they think that well, that's that's the great patriotic war business model from 1945. <laughs> We're going to stick with it. Yeah. But in terms of the press, all the focus is on D-Day. How much did they talk about what was going on in Stalingrad and these other you know huge battles on the Eastern Front? I would say on D-Day, probably next to nothing. Mm -hmm. um, but there, but you might you might find a little blurb here or there buried on the back page mm -hmm. or something on the D-Day newspapers in particular that I look at. I mean, there were there was some mention of what was going on in in, in Russia and everything, but there was there was no attempt to compare yeah. the war there with what you know we had going on. Well, the Russians would lose in one day what we would lose in a week or something like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we lost on D-Day, all told, was just under 4,000, I think. Mm -hmm. That's across the board for the Allies, and that was an afternoon Yeah, on the Eastern Front. Yeah, I think you said there was one week on the Eastern Front where they, they lost over 100,000 men. They also launched a, uh, an offensive in support of our D-Day landings, too. To keep the uh, the Germans from you know releasing divisions and moving them to the to the Western Front, so um, that was called Operation Bagration, and uh, and they took some uh, they focused on German Army Group Center, as I recall, and um, that was there was some serious brutality. I've interviewed some German veterans mm -hmm. on the receiving end of that, and uh, they just and that was coordinated with with D Day. Yes, yes. That was something that FDR, Winston Churchill, and Stalin worked out. They were going to, that was one of the agreements at one of the one of the conferences that they attended that, you know, when you when you're ready to land, we're gonna launch within a week or two uh a companion uh attack, assault, offensive, if you will. Yeah. Um, in order to make certain that the Germans don't uh, you know, don't use us as an excuse to draw off manpower to push you back into the sea. Yeah. Now you got to remember too, the Russians, they were facing, now my numbers may be a little off here. It's been a while since I looked, but 
I mean, it was something akin to, you know, between 150 to 170 German divisions were keeping the Russians at bay. We were facing in for D Day 25. Yeah. Um, now it got extended to 50 pretty quickly because they pulled some folks from southern uh, France and stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, you think of it, pretty daunting. Prominent Nazi political and military leader Hermann Goring said the following about the role of propaganda in 1946 as he awaited trial for war crimes at Nuremberg. Quote, Naturally, the common people don't want war, neither in Russia, nor in England, nor in America, nor for that matter, in Germany. That is understood. But, after all, it is the leaders of the country who determine the policy, and it is always a simple matter to drag the people along. Whether it is a democracy, or a fascist dictatorship, or a parliament, or a communist dictatorship. The people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. That is easy. All you have to do is tell them that they are being attacked and denounce the pacifist for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same way in any country. Moving on, this narrative carries on throughout the war. Right. And then what was interesting is that, you know, here it was this considered this turning event of the war right. for most historians. And yet it wasn't really commemorated after the war. On the first anniversary? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, by then with victory in Europe was assured. Eisenhower put out a little message. I had the original copy of it that basically said, you know, he he wanted a, a subdued remembrance. Mm-hmm of d-day on that day he didn't want you know like hey let's let's have a party and a barbecue or something right to celebrate it um he said you know we we need to remember you know what it took to get us where we are today and it started there yeah on those beaches and so we need to we need to be a bit solemn about that but the big commemoration of d-day didn't really happen until 40 years later when Reagan went there, it seems to. Yeah, I mean, they were, that's true. They were commemorating it. And, um, but it was mostly, we were, you know, people like Omar Bradley was showing up. Uh, there weren't, there weren't any pres there wasn't any presidential representation until Ronald Reagan. Now, Jimmy Carter did visit, but not in a, not during one of the commemorations. He did visit uh, Saint Laurent sur Mer, the, uh, uh, the, the cemetery there, but, um, but it was really Ronald Reagan that that pulled the narrative forward and formalized it so that we, you know, those of us who grew up after that, you know, after that particular generation could see it, you know, in the way that they saw it. Yeah. And um, yeah, granted, Peggy Noonan and somebody else wrote that speech for him, but they they relied heavily on what was reported. Yeah. Interesting. At the time as their sources. Yeah. Yeah. For the exact same themes. And, it, and, and you can track it all the way through President Trump. Yeah. Well, and then it became almost like a ritual that every president. Would. Well, it's considered to be a pilgrimage is the word I, mm -hmm. you know, the best way to put it is, um, you know, I, I, you know, D-Day is, 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 is a historical representation of our sense of American exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. And it's a way to go out there and say, remind, this is what we're willing to do for, for another group of people. Yeah. That's what we're willing to do. D-Day is an exemplar of that kind of, uh, that kind of value system that, you know, we will not just believe in, but act on when the time comes. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat those themes again? Because Well, the first one was it was, the, you know, it was the most significant event of the war, that it was a sacred event. I don't I don't use the word apotheosis because that's focused on an individual. Mm -hmm. So I call it sacralization because we've rendered sacred the entire event itself. So that's theme number two. The third theme is that we had the best leaders going who had the best experience and the best background and the right minds to be able to lead our young, precious troops into battle. Um, and then with the troops themselves, they were the best trained, highly motivated, highly morals coming straight off of Main Street, USA. Mm -hmm. And um, and they were going to take on people who, uh, who were the anti version of that yeah. kind of image, if you will. It's certainly a theme that is very relevant today, and I think everybody is sort of like struggling with yeah. the whole idea of um, 
sort of the free flow of information, especially in crises, whatever kind of crisis it is, it's kind of like people have a natural curiosity. It affects them. They want to know what the truth is. They want to be treated like adults. Right. And they want to know, like, okay, what are the risks? What are what are we up against? Ideological divide is the way I look at it. Yeah, it, ideological divide. I mean, basically, you've yeah. got different news organizations who are have now become associated with a particular political faction, party, and, and we've lost our ability to find the middle. Well, it's not only that. There's this huge need. It feels like the press, people in the press, and the people who are presenting information to the public feel this huge need to sort of shape it in a certain way. Yeah. Ideologically, one way or the other. It's correct. They want to shape it towards like some sort of result. Instead of just saying, hey, this is what happened. This is what we know. This is the best information we can give you. I think that there are some enterprising journalists out there, if I may interrupt for a second, yeah, sure. that, um, that are making an effort to create alternatives. In fact, one that I get on my cell phone all the time uh, is uh, I signed up for them. Uh, straight news, no, uh, you know, no commentary or anything. That's just what you're saying. They're called the 1440 Project. Uh-huh. And I think 1440 that they chose that because isn't that when the Gutenberg Bible was <laughs> right. movable print, something like that. Right. Anyway, um, but I find I find I get that every morning and that's my first go to read for, you know, the highlights of the news. It's usually three main stories and then a lot, bunch of subordinate stories and everything. Um, it's not overwhelmed with ads or anything, although it is, you know, the advertising, mm -hmm. you know, obviously is is important to them. Um, but it's, it's the straight skinny on this, this is what happened. This is what's going on and all that. Right. And I find it, I find it extremely refreshing. I mean, I've known people who are no longer my friends Yeah. because they, you know, I, you know, because one side or the other, which, which, you know, and, and I try not to talk politics with folks, but sometimes you cross that line. The politics really is a distraction. As far as I'm concerned, I just like to know what is the truth? What is yeah. really going on in any situation? Like we're adults and the American people have a lot of common sense. If you just sort of tell them the story without politicizing or casting it in a particular way, right. they can make up their mind and allow them to make up their mind. Yes, but again, it, it kind of goes back to, you know, Invasion On, your book. They treat the American people like they're children or they're, they're, yes. they're not mature enough, or they're not as clever or well-educated or whatever they think in order to make these decisions themselves. We've got to guide them to a certain conclusion and a certain result. We have to manage their perceptions of the events. Absolutely. That's the way to put it. Exactly. And it's really a very, I find, like a really anti-democratic and very negative impulse yeah, I would. I'm inclined to agree with you. It's like every issue becomes uh, blown up out of proportion. Yeah. People often ask me, like, how do you find the truth? How do you wade through all of this distraction and get to the core of the issues, big issues that affect us in, in very profound ways? Yes. Or going to war. Same thing, going to war. I remember the whole build up to the, uh, the invasion of Iraq and the weapons of mass destruction and you know i had friends in the intelligence community and military and they're telling me you know ralph there's nothing there like we've been there there's nothing there turns out it was bupkis nothing yeah and the amount of, of sacrifice that people made and the amount of money that was spent it's just mind-boggling I, I hate war yeah we all do but i mean i i just you know i, I study it yeah but uh uh, I've experienced it, um, but uh, oof, I, I tell you, um, I mean, an infantryman, airborne ranger, all that kind of stuff. Hoo yeah, yeah. But you know, after I, if I never touch another weapon again, yeah, whether it be a pistol, a rifle, or anything for any reason, I don't own a gun. I don't have anything in the house. I just won't because if you own something like that, if you have it, you'll use it. Right. And um, and I, I just and it's and war has done that to me. And it's just. Uh, Hopefully the American, you know, people are uh, learning that, you know, to be wary and to be 
mindful of understanding that, you know, the media, they're experts at manipulation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They study this. They plan this. They did it. You present that very well in your book, how they did it leading up to uh, the D-Day. And, um, and they do this all the time. And it gives you pause. You know, it's uh, yeah. It's like what you know. What's the solution? Yeah. I mean, is there a solution? I mean, you know, what's going to happen? I think it's you know what you refer to. People just you know they have to demand it and they have to look for it and uh, embrace you know those sources of news, which seems to be according to statistics and ratings happening uh, already. Yeah. Because people are losing their faith in you know, the, the, the usual networks and, and the big newspapers and seeking their news elsewhere. No, I, I do a lot of comparison analysis. I, at night I flip between, you know, like CNN or Fox or MSNBC. And I just look at how they're, you know, each one is reporting. If I can find it, the same common event or something, which usually there's one or two that are, and, 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 and I, I look at that and try to see, and I, 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 I try to figure out the differences and, but you can, you can clearly see the ideology shining through in a lot of, Oh, absolutely. And, 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 and I just think to myself, I said, my wife and I talk about it all the time. It's like, God, how, what, how, how do we get here? And yeah. how can we get out of here? I know. I don't know. I mean, it's maybe, maybe the answer is, you know, we get some, we get some, some inspiring leaders out there who are going to close the gap, you know, national leaders, I don't know, or you know, but some of them, you know, just to get to where they are now, have stoked the flames of this. They've ridden the, they've ridden that wave to their particular positions of power and everything, and they don't want to give it up. I think it has to come from the American people. Yeah, I think they have to say, you know, this isn't good enough. Uh, we're not going to read these stories. We're not going to watch these newscasts, which is happening. One of the things that you bring up in your book is that the invasion was blown up into this almost sacred event but in the context of what was going on there was a major war going on on all different fronts yeah so to just single out and put all the attention on this one event is somewhat unfair and and inaccurate because you know yes it was incredible and took great coordination and huge amount of bravery and and so on and so forth but it wasn't the only thing that was going on at the time. Where, where do presidents go to commemorate World War II? They don't go to Pearl Harbor. Right. They go somewhere out there where the, uh, you know, the last Japanese soldier gave up, wherever that might have been. That's right. You know, they go to they go to detail because it because it, it, it fits the image that we like to see ourselves in. Yeah. The exceptional Americans, you know, that, that we that we've got it all figured out and that democracy is is the way to go and, and believe me i'm a believer in our republic and our democracy yeah sure same but, here um but it's uh but we don't we don't put it into practice with our actions that well I mean, no we don't it's it's troubling it's troubling well i think it's the big frustration of the american people we see ourselves a certain way and we want to project that into the world but it doesn't happen that way yeah and the government and other things get in the way. And we're going like, well, hey, we're paying for this. We're the ones who are doing the fighting, but you're not really representing what we represent. Right. Anyway, yeah. well, Steve, thank you so much for your time. You know, this has been great. Pleasure. Thank you, Ralph, for having me. Again, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to talk. I really enjoyed it today. Thank you, Ralph. As Lieutenant Colonel Stefan Rosiecki, writes at the conclusion of his book, and I quote, news reporting in the moment when assuming the thematic trappings of myth-making can become a powerful force in masking reality. Such potent storytelling stymies any subsequent effort by historians to reveal greater truths and more meaningful interpretations, end quote. How are we, the American people, supposed to make clear-headed, informed decisions about whether or not we choose to commit our young men and women and hard-earned tax dollars to combat around the world when we are consistently misled and manipulated by propagandists working on behalf of our government. Author George Orwell said it best, the most effective way to destroy people 
is to deny and obliterate their own understanding of their history. We thank Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Rosiecki for separating truth from myth in his important book, Invasion On, D-Day, The Press, and the Making of an American Narrative. It's my great honor to name him today's Hero Behind the Headlines. Heroes Behind Headlines. Executive producer, Ralph Pizzullo. Produced and engineered by Mike Dawson. Music provided by Extreme Music. For exclusive content, please join our Patreon group at patreon.com slash heroes behind headlines.